Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen amen Shall broken be, but God the Lord the just sustains. For God He knows the just man's days, and ere their heritage remains, in evil times they won't be shaken. In days of famine will abound, but all the wicked ones of earth will pass away and sure be faith. The foolish ones, the foes of God, are like the glory. shall soon be gone in vanish they Make our joy.
Good morning, everybody. Let's have the children come on up front for the catechism. You have to bear with my extra deep voice today because my sinuses are clogged a little. There's still plenty of seats in the front. So anybody who's in the back looking for a seat, there's plenty of room up front here. All right, we'll let some more come up. Any children in the back that want to come up front for the catechism, we'll review that, and then we'll, we'll begin. All right, are you guys ready? Did you practice the question? All right. Why ought you to glorify God? That's right. Our verse is Romans eleven thirty six, and it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So why ought you to glorify God? Praise God. You may go sit with your parents. Let's stand and sing together. We were all defiled and uh, stained, and these are songs and hymns this morning. We're going to sing just the thread that runs through them of just being washed and uh, wearing the righteousness of Christ and um, uh, lots of good news to sing. So let's sing out and uh, from our hearts this morning. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? 
Turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 13. Leviticus 13. We're going to read that, a portion of that this morning for our call to worship. This morning we celebrate the purity and the purifying work of Christ Jesus to ready his bride, the church, us, today. Before we uh, read this passage, I'd like us to pray. I want us to pray about the building that we are in the process of purchasing, or buildings, I should say, and just the, uh, the due diligence that's going on right now, inspections and finances. We hope to hear in the next couple days about uh, 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 the, the loan that we're seeking. And so we just want to pray about those things. I'd like to pray as well for Pastor Ron Miller and uh, Pastor Austin McCormick at um, Covenant Baptist Church in Clarksville, Tennessee. They're part of MARBAC, uh, our association of churches, and we got to got to meet both of the, or see both of them again this week at this conference that we were, we're at and just uh, reminded me to pray for them and the warmth that we have with them. And of course, we're going to pray for regeneration this morning. Pray with me. Lord God, we are so thankful that you are giving us a new facility, Lord, that can accommodate the, the growth that you're giving to us. And we come before you to pray and seek your face, Lord, for the, the remaining portions over these next weeks, Lord, that we need in terms of favorable answers uh, to the inspections, uh, loan requirements, different things that are taking place now. And we pray and ask for your favor. We pray and ask for your blessing, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you are clearly doing, what is evident to us, providentially, Lord, to have given these places to us. And Father, we pray as our hearts and minds are set on them and we start to plan, Lord, that you would bless our thoughts, Lord, that we could be a light in Shelbyville through these new facilities. Lord, that you would be glorified uh, more and more in Shelbyville because of their location and the proclamation of the gospel that goes forth. We ask for your hand and help, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we also come before you to pray for Pastors uh, Miller and McCormick, Lord, at Covenant Bap uh, Baptist Church there in Clarksville. Lord, will you greatly bless that congregation as they hear the word preached this morning. May they be emboldened, their hearts inflamed, Lord, with the gospel. May their zeal for evangelism ever increase, God. May their hearts just burn to hear the gospel uh, ringing out in Clarksville. We pray, God, that you would add to their number, Lord, that you'd give even more elders to them. Lord, help them with their diaconate, we pray. Just your blessing upon them in, in every way possible, we ask it, Lord, uh, for your glory in Clarksville. And Lord, we come as a church today asking, Lord, for what you can only do in our midst, and that's regenerating dead hearts. We pray, Lord, uh, that you would purify us, and you would sanctify us, Lord, beginning with the stain of our sin, Lord, you would take that off of someone this morning, that they would have that realization, God, that sin has been removed and righteousness has been imputed. We pray, Lord, for regeneration in our midst. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, stand with me. We're going to read from verse 47 through the end of the chapter here of Leviticus 13. This is God's word. When a garment has a mark of leprosy in it, whether it is a wool garment or a linen garment, whether it is the warp or wool uh, or of linen or of wool, whether in leather or in an article made of leather, if the mark is greenish and reddish in the garment or in the leather or in the warp and the wool uh, or in an, any article of leather, it is a leprous mark and shall be shown to the priest. And then the priest shall look at the mark and shall quarantine the article with the mark for seven days. He shall then look at the mark on the seventh day, and if the mark has spread in the garment, whether in the warp or in the wolf, or in the leather, whether uh, whatever the purpose of which the leather is used, the mark is a leprous malignancy, it is unclean. So he shall burn the garment, whether the uh, warp or the wolf, in wool or in linen or in any article of leather in which the mark occurs, for it is a leprous malignancy. It shall be burned in the fire. 
But if the priest shall look, and indeed the mark has not spread in the garment, either in the warp or the wolf, or in any article of leather, then the priest shall order them to be uh, washed, to wash the thing in which the mark occurs, and he shall quarantine it for seven more days. After the article which the mark has been washed, the priest shall again look, and if the mark has not changed its appearance, even though the mark has not spread, it is unclean. You shall burn it in the fire. Whether uh, an eating away has produced barrenness on the top or on the front of it. Then, if the priest looks, and if the mark has faded after it has been washed, then he shall tear it out of the garment and out of the leather, whether uh, from the warp or the wolf. And if, he, uh, if it appears again in the garment, whether in the warp or in the wolf, or in any article of leather, it is an outbreak. The article with the mark shall be burned in the fire. The garment, whether the warp or the wolf, or uh, any article of leather from which the war, uh, mark has departed when you wash it, uh, it shall then be washed a second time and will be clean. This is the law for the mark of leprosy in a garment of wool or linen, whether in the warp or the wolf, and in any article of leather for pronouncing it clean or unclean. This is God's word.
Please turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Our text this morning is verse 10 through 16. But we will begin and read from verse 1 of chapter 2 through verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, and by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially, this is our text, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. 
having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey speaking with a voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we pray that you would strengthen your church this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stains, Paul calls them. The false teachers here in chapter 2. There are, there are few things on earth as glorious as a bride walking down the aisle on her wedding day. Perhaps I should say that this was the case um, before they stored, started ordering gowns from David's brothel. Now some of you are thinking I might I should have said that, but it's too late. Our modern degeneracies aside, there are a few things as glorious as a bride in pure white being led down the aisle by her father to be given to her betrothed. As the family's led in one by one and everyone sits down and everyone's waiting, all of a sudden the music changes and a hush comes over the group and the doors in the back come open and everyone stands up and turns around in the climax of that moment. There's few things as glorious as that. Now imagine in that moment, the doors come open, and a man in the back steps out of the aisle with a handful of mud and throws it upon the bride. Imagine the indignation of her father. Imagine the indignation of the man that she's being given to. Imagine the indignation from the whole group. Can you feel it? You're ready to wring the guy's neck. Like, how could you do that? Stains. There are men who are stains on society. Maybe the most poignant example of that would be pirates. Now, in, in our, our day, for years, Hollywood has romanticized this idea of pirates through movies like Pirates of the Caribbean with the mostly likable Jack Sparrow, right? Mostly harmless. You know, he's just harmless. He's just a blumbering idiot. He's kind of funny. He's harmless. But the reality of these men was far from harmless in what is portrayed on a screen. The man Jack Sparrow in the movie was based off of an English pirate named John Ward. His name was John Ward, but they called him Jack Ward. His nickname was Birdie. Like all pirates, he preyed on the weak for unrighteous gain and lived his life indulging sinful desires and despising authority. The Venetian ambassador said this of him, without doubt the greatest scoundrel to ever sell from England. An English sailor in 1608 described him this way, a very short man with little hair and that quite white, bald in front, swarthy face and beard, speaks little and almost always swearing, drunk from morn till night, The habits of a thorough salt, a fool and an idiot out of his trade. He was known for having wives in England and Italy. To avoid the hangman's noose, he converted to Islam and sought refuge in Tunis under the protection of an Ottoman officer. It was a stain on society, a blemish on the record of English sailors, creatures of instinct to be captured and killed. When a pirate was caught, he was normally hung at the entrance of a large port in such a way that his body wouldn't come apart, and he would be seen by all as a warning to those tempted to pursue wickedness. Blackbeard's head was hung from the mast of the ship that captured him, uh, that finally captured him, one of the most famous pirates to ever sail. We've romanticized pirates, but in reality they were rapists, thieves, and murderers to be destroyed without pity. Now, there are a few things in our day, anyway, that we, absolute, that we have absolutely no pity for. 
One of those things is coyotes. No one pities coyotes, especially if you're from Kentucky. I've never met a coyote defender. Tree huggers, but no coyote, coyote defenders. I've lost several sheep and lambs to coyotes over the years. And in 2019, there was over 300,000 reported livestock deaths from coyotes in the U.S. and countless injuries, even attacks on people. In Kentucky, to my knowledge, it's the only animal that you can hunt day or night with any weapon of your choosing and at any point. There is no, uh, there is no season for coyotes. They cannot be eradicated and must be constantly watched for and guarded against. They should be hunted, trapped, and ran over every chance we get. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Please. But we don't pity the coyote. I mean, they're canines. They're kind of, if it was a dog, we would pity it. We don't pity the coyote. We pity the lambs. We don't pity the pirate hanging from the gallows. Rather, we pity the hardworking men they murdered, and the women and children they abused, the little children that starved because of their robberies. That's who we pity, not the pirate. And this, saints, is how Peter describes the false teachers in the church. We'll look at our text this morning under two headings. The description of false prophets and the disdain for false prophets. The description and the disdain. So Peter describes them, and then we see his disdain for them. So first we'll look at the description of false prophets. We're going to look at 11 descriptions that Peter gives of the false prophets. And this will by far be my longest point, so please don't despair. But let's look at verse 10. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. So the first thing we see is that they indulge evil desires. So as we saw last week, Peter points back to the days of Noah and the day of Lot as examples of those who indulged in sin and where that leads. And what do we see in the narrative of Noah and the narrative of Lot? We see God's destruction upon the wicked. His grace, but His destruction of the wicked. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah pursued their lust. So far, they pursued and indulged evil desires to the point that they lost their desire for women and burned with passion for men. Lot's wife grew so fond of Sodom that she couldn't help but turn back and look in lustful desire even as God was destroying it. This is the hold that evil desires can have upon us. He or she is always the false teacher. He or she is always lusting after their own desires. And the church is just simply a means to that end. So for the false teacher, the church is a way to fulfill their lustful desires. The kingdom of God is not sought for its own sake, but only as a means to to be leveraged, to be squeezed, so they can get pleasure out of it. It's for the benefit of the false teacher. And this is why the things that you see these men and women stand for always seem to conveniently align with the floating, rotting carcass of the world. They always seem to be going with the flow of the dead world. And they use the Scripture, twisting it, of course, but they use the Scripture to justify agreeing with the world. When you see men using Scripture to justify things like homosexuality, open borders, childless marriages, welfare, immodesty, pornography, feminism, polygamy, pluralism, abortion, BLM, social justice, I could go on and on and on, but these men are everywhere. Well, they will make the case for these things based on twisting Scripture. Twist not Scripture lest you be like Satan. Satan knows Scripture and he used it. And he tried to make arguments for it, with it. And this is what the false teacher does. He'll use Scripture. He'll claim the authority of God. But he's, it always so convenient 
that his view of the Scripture goes right along with the course of this world. Now, while someone might genuinely be wrong on some of these that I just named and not be a false teacher, what I'm pointing out is that there's a pattern. The false teacher has a pattern of fulfilling his desires, their desires, through the church. As I said, the church is a means to an end. They use Bible verses to prove their viewpoint, and they would rather indulge their flesh while wearing a veneer of godliness. Saints, do not be deceived. Men like Russell Moore, David French, or Ravi Zacharias, men who will sell their soul in order to be thought well of by the world. Number two, they despise authority. So number one is they indulge fleshly desires. Number two, the second description that Peter gives us of the false teacher is that they despise authority. So Peter describes the false teacher as one who despises any authority over him. Now, y'all think about this. These two sins always go hand in hand. You will always find them together. Someone that indulges the lust of their flesh will always be one who despises authority because authority restrains his ability to fulfill his lusts. If you want to enjoy, indulge, rather, your flesh, you're going to fight against anything that restrains your sin, whether that authority is civil, ecclesiastical, or familial. You're going to fight and buck that authority because you want to do what you want to do. We saw this in, in the 60s in full force in the sexual revolution. The sin that had been running rampant in people's hearts now was running rampant in the streets. We saw it. Men throwing off the yoke, throwing off authority, throwing off government so that they could fulfill their desires. Free love and such nonsense. We see this exponentially in our day in the LGBT pedophile cult. They are going to pursue their sin and despise with pure hatred anything that hinders that. And you see that. But saints, authority comes from God. And God's people do not despise authority. Now you may be thinking, now wait a minute, Pastor. You've talked about resisting wicked authority quite a bit, so what's the difference? I'm glad you asked. Romans 13 tells us, remember for the last three, four years, all we've heard is Romans 13. It's like a broken clock. It's not like a broken clock, it's like something else, but forgive me. I'm getting my analogies mixed up. Well, we've heard it constantly, right? Romans 13, Romans 13. But what does Romans 13 tell us? It tells us that the civil authority gets its, the civil realm gets its authority from where? From God. It is God's deacon, God's servant. And God says that the purpose of government is to what? Reward the good and punish the evil. So what do you have when civil government rewards evil and punishes good? You have an illegitimate authority or an illegitimate action or inaction by an authority. And in that case, saints, we are not only allowed to resist, but we're commanded to. Christians are law-abiding, law-loving people. And when we resist authority, it is not because we despise authority, but because we despise rebels to authority. We despise those who would throw off the yoke of authority and claim themselves as the authority instead of recognize that their authority comes from God. Say, Caesar is Lord. No, I will not. Say that men can be women. No. Say that love is love. Won't do it. Say that abortion is health care. Nope, not going to do it. We say no, not because we despise authority, but because we love authority. And the hierarchy that God has built into the world. And we despise those who are at war with it. You also see this despising of authority in the church. You've been caught in sin. 
And now instead of submitting to the church and the church's rebuke of that sin and humbling yourself, you what? You just simply go to another church. And you threaten legal action against your church if they pursue you. It happened here. How dare you say something to me about modesty, Pastor? Who do you think you are? How dare you rebuke me for forsaking the assembly for my kids' sports? Wait, wait, what do you mean a plurality of elders? I'm the pastor here. I despise authority. So what about the family? Wife, do you despise the way that God has made the family? Do you despise the hierarchy, the natural hierarchy that God has set up in the family? Children, y'all listening to me, kids? Do y'all despise your parents' authority? I see a kid in the back shaking his head. Father, do you show that you despise your authority by abdicating it? The false teacher is one who despises authority. Saints, let that not be us. So the third thing that false teachers, the third description that Peter gives here of false teachers is that he's in our text, it says they're daring. This means presumptuous is what the word means, presumptuous. They're, they're daring. The false teacher is daring because he presumes that he's in the right. And he forges ahead without considering what God's word says or seeking counsel. He doesn't need counsel. He asks himself, and he shockingly agrees. He doesn't need counsel. The presumptuous man is often considered brave and bold, but he's simply arrogant. Romans 2, 3 through 5 says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Do you live in the same sins that you condemn and believe that you are in Christ is to presume upon the grace of God? And I would encourage you to stop testing God. Turn from your sin and humble yourself. The Word of God says that He gives grace to the humble and He is near to the brokenhearted. We need to stop presuming upon the grace of God and start repenting and trusting in the grace of God. The fourth thing, that the, the fourth description of the, of the false teacher is that he is self-willed. To be self-willed is to claim autonomous authority over your own desires, words, and actions. It's to be ruled by your wants, your needs, or your emotions. It's what it means to be self-willed. In Titus 1, we are told that for a man to be qualified as an elder of the church, he must not be self-willed. Titus 1, 7, for an overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. Now, this word translated self-willed in Titus 1-7 is our exact same word here, self-willed. Same word is used, okay? The false teacher is self-willed. The shepherd of God's people must not, cannot be self-willed. Are you self-willed? What governs your thoughts, your words, and your actions? You or God's word. When you're tempted to sin, what holds you back? What keeps you from sin? Self-willed men, husbands, fathers, listen to me. Self-willed men are either harsh to their wives or they're led by their wives. Self-willed men either rule their children through anger or they abdicate discipline. That's what self-ruled men do. 
May we be those who bow our wills to Christ and not to ourselves. Self-willed women are those that nag their husbands or neglect the work of keeping their home. May we not be self-willed. The fifth description that Peter gives us of the false teacher is that they're fearless of majesty. There in verse 10. It says, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. False teachers are fearless of majesty. Now the word translated here, revile, means to blaspheme. And the word translated angelic majesties is the word doxa. It should be familiar. We sing the doxology at the end. It has to do with worship and honor and honorable things and people in honorable positions. Okay? Majesties. So it has the idea here of men, there again, who despise authority. They despise those things that God has set up to be honored. Bottom line, they do not fear God. Saints, if we are those who fear God, if we are to be those who fear God, then we must honor what He calls as honorable. If you flip back to 1 Peter 1, 16 and 17, it says this, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now in our text, verse 11 says this, Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Angels don't even revile the wicked. When they accuse them to God, they don't blaspheme them. They don't slander them unnecessarily. They don't mock them. They lay the case, and they don't blaspheme those that are made in God's image. They leave it to God to deal with them. This is another reason that we must be very careful to honor authority structures God has placed in the world and not revile this, that, that what he has made and how he has made it. This is a call for us to fear God. Now if we look at verse 12, read that with me. But these, speaking of the false teachers, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. And Peter is not holding back here. They are unreasoning, is the sixth description that Peter gives. They act like animals. Their actions aren't driven by reason, but rather their reason is driven by their lust. Now, if you have lived in Kentucky long, you have either hit a deer, almost hit a deer, or you will hit a deer. It is just the way it is in Kentucky, okay? Now, why do you have to be extra careful during the rut or during mating season? Because the bucks chasing the does, they are chasing the does, and they're driven by instinct, not reason. In mating season, a doe and a buck will run into the interstate completely oblivious of the giant trucks, headlights, and honking horns. Creatures of instinct running headlong to their destruction. We've all heard about how the, the Indians would kill buffalo, right? They'd chase them, scare them, get them panicked, run them off a cliff. <laughs> it's a lot easier than throwing a sharp stick at them. The buffalo, you get one going, the rest will follow because why? Creatures of instinct made to be destroyed. Like the mad buck during the rut, false teachers run after their base desires and give no thought that they are running to their doom. Proverbs 27 says, The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Often those in the church, us, are accused of abandoning reason. We're accused of abandoning reason for a fairy tale book. But we're accused of this by those who claim that wet rocks became people. Okay? Somehow, rocks become people, and those people develop a sense of morality and beauty and a longing to worship. 
And then we are accused of neglecting reason. It's insanity. No, the church has not forsaken reason. It's rather the atheist who has forsaken reason so that he might pursue his sin. And he turns and he mocks you as he chases his desires onto the interstate of God's wrath and is destroyed. Reviling where they have no knowledge, our text says. They blaspheme what they do not understand in the same way that a hyena laughs. They act like animals. And they trade their reason for lust, and their lust drives their reason. So yeah, they're smart men. But because their lust is driving the boat, they have to make arguments against God. They have to. Because they're driven by their lust, and they cannot be submitted to God. Do not trade reason for lust. These false teachers are doomed for destruction and will perish just like the deer that never saw that truck. And it left nothing but a mess for the buzzards. Verse 13, the seventh description that he gives is that they revel in their deceptions in broad daylight. Look at verse 13. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Revel in their deceptions in broad daylight. The word translated revel here is is used in Luke 7.25. Luke 7.25 says this. This was when Christ was speaking of John the Baptist. And he says, What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. This word luxury is our word, revel. This word means uh, um, effeminacy through indulgence. It means becoming soft through indulging yourself. The false teacher seeks to deceive the church, and they revel luxuriously in their success. They recline on their bed, and they enjoy the fruit of their deceptions, and they take joy in the fact that they're leading men astray, that they're successful. Think of men like Kenneth Copeland. The man knows exactly what he's doing, and he revels in his deception in broad daylight. Look at verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. So the eighth description that Peter gives us is that they have eyes full of lust that never stops, never ceases. Every woman they see is an object of lust. Their eyes are full of adultery. I know a man who before he was saved, before he was a Christian, he was a music minister in a Baptist church. And that sounds funny to say that, but that's the way he will describe it. And his main goal in life was to seduce the women in the choir. And that's what he did before God saved him. You think of men like Ravi Zacharias. Their eyes are full of adultery. Now, men, this may seem unthinkable. What that man as a choir director was doing, it may seem, and I hope it does, it may seem unthinkable to you, but let me ask you this. Do you view the women who come across your path or across your screen as fair game to be checked out? Is it a habit? Eyes full of adultery. Perhaps you would never act on it, you think, in your mind. I'd never act on it text doesn't say you acted on it. It says you have eyes full of adultery. Just as our Christ said, that for he who looks at a woman with lust, with lustful intent, has committed adultery already in his heart. Men, have you, like Job, made a covenant with your eyes to look with desire at no one but your wife? Our text is describing false teacher, but my question is, is it describing you? This is a battle of life and death. And the second that you relax, you're toast. 
You're toast. Sin isn't being fought in the heart of the false teacher. It's being embraced. Sin is what they want. Sin is what they think about. It's a constant running after. And, and they put on a great facade. And my, my question is, are some of you putting on a great facade, but you think about and your eyes are full of lust constantly? There's an old tale, and some people claim it, it's not true, it never happened, whatnot, but you can read about it. Some, some of the old Eskimos tell about how they used to kill bears and wolves. And it said that they would freeze a knife into bloody water and leave it out for a bear to find. And as the bear would lick the ice, it would melt and slowly reveal the knife. They would then start cutting his tongue. Well, he's already tasting blood, and so when his blood is mixed with it, he doesn't realize it's his blood, so he just keeps going. And, and it's warm and now, and it, it's more taste and more, all this, so it, it's even more. And he's just licking harder and harder. And he keeps doing this till eventually he's lost so much blood that he's easy to kill. This is what lust does to you. You keep going, never satisfied, always wanting more, until it's too late and you are ripe for destruction. The ninth description that Peter gives of the false teacher is that they entice the weak. So look in our text. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed to curse children, enticing unstable souls. So the word translated unstable here means unfixed. Okay? Think of something that's not tied down. Okay, so if a tornado was in charge of the steering wheel, we know God drives tornadoes, but if the tornado's driving, he's always going to the trailer park, okay, always, because he can just whip them bad boys up like it ain't nothing and throw them wherever he wants. He's going to pick the trailer park instead of the, how, the neighborhood with the bricked houses that are tied to a concrete basement. They hone in on the weak and the unstable and that which is not tied down. This is what the, uh, the false teacher does. The coyote goes for the unprotected lambs. The pirate rubs his hands over the fat merchant ship and over the unprotected port. This is why, saints, we need to strive to be those who are stable and fixed in our faith, tied to the Word of God, and be about helping those who are weak. We are not to view the weak as a way for us to be more exalted in our strength, but to be shorn up and pulled up beside us. The tenth way that Peter describes the false teachers in our verse here in chapter 14, in verse 14, excuse me, is having a heart trained in greed. Now, the word train here means to exercise the way that they would exercise, the way the Greek athletes would exercise, and they would wrestle together okay, and grow their muscles. The false teacher literally exercises his heart in greed. It's like every day he's adding another, another uh, barbell of greed to his bar to strengthen himself so that his heart grows harder and more calloused, and he can handle being worse exercising his greed and his heart grows thicker and harder number 11 this is our last description of the false teacher they forsake the right way for unjust gain so read verse 15 and 16 with me forsaking the right way they have gone astray having followed the way of balaam the son of baor who loved the wages of unrighteousness but he received a rebuke for his own transgression. For a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. Now, for the sake of time this morning, we're not going to go to Numbers and read this story. But most of you should know it and remember it. Balaam has been offered money to curse God's people. He says, I can only say what God gives me to say, but he's willing to try to curse God's people in order to get paid, in order to receive compensation and money. He's going, he's on his donkey, and an angel of the Lord is in the path. 
And long story short, he beats the donkey because the donkey keeps turning off the path because of the angel. And the donkey turns around and talks to him. And the wildest part of the story is not that the donkey talks to him. It's that Balaam talks back and acts like it's normal. Like I, I read that three or four times this week thinking about this passage. And Balaam's just like, the donkey says, why are you beating me? And he's like, because you're not doing what's right. I just, I can't fathom that. A man, that, anyway. Like Balaam, the false teacher knows what is right and true, and he forsakes it for wealth. He forsakes it, the way of righteousness, for the wages of unrighteousness. Who is the, the pinnacle of this? Judas. This is the way Judas, who followed Christ for years. Y'all remember, Judas was sent out with the other apostles. Judas was sent out to preach, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to exercise authority in the name of Christ. He saw Christ heal the lame. He saw Christ raise the dead. He saw blind men see. He saw the power of the gospel transform lives. And he betrayed his Lord for shiny rocks with which he could purchase pleasure and ease. He thinks this is how dangerous the love of money is. This is why the scripture says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Saints, this is why we must guard our hearts against the love of money. The false teacher, oh, he's consumed with it. How can I squeeze the church to make myself rich? How can I benefit personally from the church of Jesus Christ? And this is the danger in loving money. It's a snare that has led countless astray from the way of righteousness. I can't help but think that Peter's mind, when he's writing this, that his mind goes back to Ananias and Sapphira. And that love of money and the desire to deceive the church and being struck dead by God. Guard your heart, saints. So that is how Peter describes the false prophets. That's point one. Now, disdain for the false teachers. Saints, it's clear from our passage, he's not just pointing out these people are wrong. He disdains them. He, he abhors false teachers. Peter is burning with righteous indignation as he writes this. He's thinking of names. He's thinking of individuals. As we, as we talked about in our sermon session, this is not written to a single church. Or I think Paul, I mean, I think Peter would have named names. So you see Paul, when he's writing to specific churches, he does name names. He's like, Alexander the, uh, the coppersmith, that guy, bad guy. I think if Peter had been writing to a specific church, he would have named names. But he was writing to those who were spread abroad. On top of all the sins that Peter has laid at the feet of these false teachers, he does not shy away from calling them what they are. And this is what he calls them. In verse 12, he calls them dumb animals to be captured and killed. In, uh, in verse 13, he calls them stains and blemishes. In verse 14, he calls them accursed children. And in verse 15, he, calls, he says that they are like Balaam. Shameful. And Peter here gives us a blueprint for how we are to view false teachers in the church. Okay? We don't like this because it's not nice. But when we are pitying the false teacher and not being clear and blunt as the Apostle Peter is, we're pitying the coyote and not the lamb. Okay? But like coyotes, these men are to be hunted down and condemned without pity. They are to be viewed as the stains on the wedding dress that must be removed before the bride can walk down the aisle. Ladies, can you imagine? You're about to go in, and someone throws mud on you. How can you go in now? Covered in stains. Terrific. Accursed children. This makes you think of Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were like the na- the and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, accursed children, children of wrath. Saints, this was true of us, but it's still true of the false prophet. Accursed children, refusing grace, deserving wrath. For those who reject Christ, there is nothing to look forward to but being crushed under a rod of iron. And we tend to have pity because we too were once lost in our sins. We were the children of wrath. And so we tend to have pity towards those who are still caught up in it. And to some extent we should, saints. But those who Peter is describing who are intentionally attacking the church of the living God are not to be pitied in that way. They are not to be tolerated. Let me, let me. Christ has no pity for those who would harm his bride. Let me, let me give you men an a, 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 a anecdote. You, you come home from work and you walk into your house And there's a stranger standing in your kitchen, repeatedly slapping your wife. How much do you pity that man? Okay, there's two options. You're going to remove the man from your house or remove his soul from his body. Maybe both. That's the two options. Okay? This is how Christ views the false teachers. They are stains and blemishes on his bride that must be removed. If you caught someone trying to kidnap one of your children, you would have no pity. You don't care what circumstances led him to enter your house and attack your wife. It doesn't matter. You don't care. In that moment, what you care about is the protection of your bride. You wouldn't ask him why he's doing it. You wouldn't empathize with him. You would remove him. And say, this is how Christ views his church. I have heard men call the modern church a whore. And and to my shame, I followed their example back in the day. This was very popular back in the day with men like Derek Webb. Let's see how that turned out. But saints, we're not allowed to talk about the bride of Christ in this way. When we do this, we've become the man throwing mud on the bride at the beginning of this in my introduction. We become that man. Now, have some churches become the synagogues of Satan? Yes. And we should always be about calling out errors that we see. But we should be very careful how we speak about the bride of Christ. Angels don't even blaspheme the wicked. And how much more should we be careful that we do not revile and slander the church of God? May we not be guilty of throwing mud on the church because we see the stains of false teachers. Instead, the answer is that we deal with the false teachers. They're to be dealt with. They're to be removed. They are not to be tolerated. Peter wrote this letter to the church. Saints, one-third of this letter deals with false prophets. One-third of this letter is dedicated to the danger that false prophets are to the church. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Saints, listen to me. Because Christ must receive a bride without stain or blemish, false teachers must be described and disdained and dealt with. They must be. Because Christ must receive his bride without spot or wrinkle. Ephesians 5, 26. That he, speaking of Christ, might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now this word spot, without spot or wrinkle in Ephesians 5, is the exact same word translated stain 
in 2 Peter for the false teacher. Same word. Christ cleanses his church by washing her with the water of the word week after week after week so that the false teacher is rebuked by the word of God. And the bride is strengthened and cleansed. And so the psalmist writes in Psalm 51, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Saints, the hope for the false teacher is not us tolerating them. The hope for the false teacher is the same as it is for us. It's Christ. So if you think back of our descriptions that Peter gives us of the false teachers, saints, our, our hope is not in figuring out a way to stop indulging our flesh, but to trust in Christ who never indulged his flesh. Salvation doesn't come by trying to honor earthly authority, but it comes by submitting to the one who honored authority perfectly. Saints, thinking that you can gain favor with God by not being presumptuous is presumptuous. Some of you will get that on the way home. But rather, saints, the answer is to look to Christ, who was never presumptuous. Never. He was never like the false teacher. Let me ask you this. Can we will ourselves to not be self-willed? It's hopeless. Instead, we hope in the one who prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And we find our hope in him. The false teacher is like an unreasoning animal born to be killed and thinking himself to be wise. But the true teacher, the wisest of all, and born to be king, did what seems so unreasonable. He became a lamb to be slaughtered. The false teacher has eyes always full of lust, but our true teacher has eyes always full of love for his church and hatred for her enemies. The false teacher takes advantage of the weak. Christ became weak so that those that by faith in him, we could be strong. False teachers forsake the right way for unjust gain. But the true te teacher forsook the riches of heaven in order to ransom his bride. The false teachers are accursed children. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The true teacher became a curse for his children. And if you're here this morning and you fit the description of the false teacher, then I implore you to humble yourself and flee to Christ. Or you will be crushed. And if you are a believer here this morning, I implore you to look to Christ. From the oldest all the way down to Benaiah, I call upon you this morning to repent of your sins and put your faith in the true teacher who is gentle with his church and harsh with his enemies. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to detect the false teacher in our midst. We pray that you would help us to describe them, to detest them, to deal with them in a way that honors you. Father, we pray that we would not go la grow lax in this, word, in this work. Father, we pray that you would help us to examine our hearts. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to put our trust in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Is this on? There we go. Word of correction to a brother. I believe Willow is younger than Benaiah. There you go. We want to respond to the message by coming to the table. As we do, I want us to reflect on Revelation 19 and uh, verses 7 through 9. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Uh, we have a foretaste of, uh, of that by coming to this table now. And, uh, and this is for believers who are, have been clothed, equipped by Christ in his righteousness, and we, uh, in turn, we walk in righteousness, and we uh, do the works that have been per, uh, uh, predestined for us to do uh, as believers, and, and we are not saved by doing those works or being the perfect, as our brother has described. It's because he himself is perfect, and he himself gives to us the righteousness that we need, and so we come to this table celebrating that, that what Christ has done for us that it took his death and the shedding of his blood to redeem a people uh, to himself. We, his bride, we come today uh, rejoicing and, and professing faith in him, his work, his purity, and the purification that he has done for us. And so we want to come to this table uh, reflecting upon uh, the great sacrifice that Christ has, uh, has, uh, has done for his people, and knowing as we come to this that he also is raised from the dead. And uh, we, his people, we are charged to proclaim his death uh, to those around us. This itself is a proclamation. So therefore, all of that to say to you, this is for believers. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, uh, this is not for you. And it's okay to sit while others are coming up uh, here. This is not for uh, those that have just professed faith today in this message, if you've been convicted, I would prefer, and you should, come and see me or one of the pastors. Let's talk about what that means because there are warnings that come with this table and taking it in an unworthy way. And so we want to talk to you about that before we would permit you to come to the table. Again, it's okay to sit. You don't have to under the pressure of other, everybody else coming. If you're fleeing from another church, you're in, under church discipline, the elders of that church have spoken to you about something and you guys are unreconciled to that. Don't, don't come here fleeing to our table thinking that you can flee from that. We want to encourage you to go back, be reconciled to your church. Come as a visitor. You're welcome to come to our table, uh, but, but don't come fleeing from another church. Um, those are the caveats that I want to present to you this morning. As you come, there will be a time of uh, reflection, silently gathering. I will encourage you to just prayerfully examine your heart and uh, come, um, yeah, just come thinking about Christ as you do. The outer ring of our, of our table here is, is going to be uh, juice, and then the rest of it will be real wine, and so be mindful.